All right, it looks like we can go ahead and get started. Hello again, my name is Kira Sobers and I am the Media Digitization Manager at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, where we collect, preserve, and share the history of the Smithsonian Institution. On behalf of the archives, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program and the seventh installment in the Smithsonian 175th Film Fest, Films from the Smithsonian Institution Archives. Before we get started, I want to gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway people on whose ancestral homelands I live, as well as the diverse and vibrant Native communities who make their home here. I encourage everyone to learn more about the historic and current Native communities in the area that you call home through your local museums and centers, as well as the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. And now for a few details about how this will all work. The chat box is where we'll be communicating with you throughout the program and where we'll post links as they come up in the discussion. If you are having technical problems, please send a private chat to either myself, Kira Sobers, or Emily Neckrish, my co-coordinator today, and we will try to help you out. If you have any questions throughout the program, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them towards the end of the program. We hope you will join us next month for the eighth installment in our film fest on March 24th from 5 to 6 p.m. The films from this month feature interviews with Roxy Laybourne, forensic ornithologist at the National Museum of Natural History, and scenes from her team's work in the Forensic Ornithology Lab. We'll be joined by Feather Identification Lab Director, Dr. Carla Dove, who will share some background about her work in forensic ornithology. Dove, who worked closely with Laybourne, will also be available to answer questions from the audience. For today's presentation, Dr. Pamela Hansen and Hannah Byrne will introduce the video history program and the Black Aviators who participated in it. Then we will screen clips from the Black Aviators video history collection featuring interviews with Janet Harmon Bragg and Cornelius Coffey. Following the film, Pan Pam and Hannah will answer questions from the audience. Pamela Henson is the historian for the history of the Smithsonian at the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. With a PhD in history, she directs the Oral History Project. Her research interests include history of the Smithsonian, museums, natural history, minority and women's history, and use of visual materials in oral history. Hannah Byrne is a historian working in the Institutional History Division in the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives. She helps manage the Smithsonian Oral History Program, conducts research on the history of the Smithsonian, provides reference for researchers, and works on public projects related to the history of the institution. She holds a master's degree in public history from American University. And now, Pam and Hannah, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Kira. Um, and hi, everyone. We're so glad to be here today um, to share this incredible collection and a little bit of context about the narrators and the work it took to preserve these memories. So the Smithsonian Video History Program was a 1980s pan-Smithsonian project funded by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to experiment with the use of video to conduct oral history interviews. The interviews covered a wide range of topics in the history of science and technology. David Dvorkin of NASA was PI, and Terry Schwarzman was the project manager. There were 26 projects covering medical technology, endangered species, many other topics. And keep in mind, these are primary source interviews you're looking at today, and these have not been edited into a program. One proposal came from Ted Robinson, who was an FAA employee who was on detail to the National Air and Space Museum, working on the Black Wings exhibit. A Tuskegee Airman himself, Robinson wanted to gather together five African-American pilots from an earlier generation to record their reminiscences. They included Alfred Anderson, Janet Harmon Bragg, Cornelius Coffey, Harold Hurd, and Lewis Jackson, all of whom struggled to enter aviation in the 1930s, but made significant achievements. Ted wanted them to look back a half a century to share with future generations the life lessons they had learned on their journeys. The video history program provided the funding to do just that. And while we have incredible interviews with all five aviators, today we'll be sharing clips from Janet Harmon Bragg and Cornelius Coffey. Cornelius Coffey was entranced by aviation as a boy in Arkansas and tried to enter training in aviation, but it was not open to African-Americans. He became an automotive mechanic 
eventually trained in aviation mechanics and became a pilot. He opened his own school and he trained many of the men who became the Tuskegee Airmen in World War II. Next. After World War II, Coffey created a very successful aviation training program for Chicago public schools until his retirement in 1969, especially at this school, Dunbar Vocational High School. And this was to prepare high school students for careers in aviation and aviation mechanics. Born in 1907 in Griffin, Georgia, Janet Harmon Bragg pursued a nursing degree at Spelman College in Atlanta, where she qualified as a registered nurse. She moved to Chicago to work at Wilson Hospital in 1929. And in 1933, having always been interested in learning to fly, Bragg became the only woman in her class when she enrolled at the Aeronautical University in Chicago under the instruction of Cornelius Coffey and John C. Robinson. And though all of the students were black, she did face gender discrimination from her fellow classmates Mates who thought women didn't belong in this line of work. And in 1943, in the midst of the Second World War, Bragg applied to the Women's Air Force Service Pilots Organization, also known as WASP. And even though she trained white women who eventually became WASP, Bragg was not admitted because she was a Black woman. Bragg then applied to the Military Nurse Corps, but was also denied admission there too. And we'll hear more about this story from Bragg later in the program in her own words. Bragg then enrolled in the civilian uh, pilot training program at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama to earn her commercial pilot's license. She took her flight test, passed with flying colors, but was, but was denied a license because she was a Black woman. And when Bragg returned to Chicago, she retook the examination and passed, becoming the first Black woman to receive a commercial pilot's license. And this collection is incredibly popular. We get requests to use it all the time, um, but we get a lot of specific requests for Bragg's story in particular from children's book authors to researchers, um, journalists, and people just interested in her story or even people who just kind of come across a, like a two minute clip we have on our Smithsonian Institution Archives YouTube page. Um, it's always a, a great joy to be able to share her story with people. Uh, the collection came to Smithsonian Archives before the internet, before there's any social media or instantaneous global communications. The collection was analog, paper transcripts, magnetic videotapes. Academic researchers could find the interviews, but the general public uh, were not able to find them. Next slide. Shortly after the Smithsonian joined the World Wide Web in the mid-1990s, my coworker, Jennifer Nichols, suggested that in addition to our academic database, we produce web pages for the oral history collection. Yahoo did not yet crawl anything but the header of the web page. So we put the pages in HTML by hand and put the header um, in the header. We put all of these names and subject terms we could think of. Within a week of loading that page, I got a telephone call, no text, no emails yet, from the school librarian at Dunbar Vocational High School in Chicago. Students there wanted to do an exhibit about this amazing Cornelius Coffey who had taught there, but they could not find anything about him. So we sent them the VHS tapes and photocopies of the transcripts. I knew that the NASA archives had some files that Ted had compiled on them as well. And they sent uh, the files along to Dunbar as well, uh, photographs and biographical research. And Coffey became a major figure in Dunbar's history. And we now started to get much more regular requests for all the speakers, especially Janet Harmon Bragg. Next. As technology changed, Kira Sober, who you met earlier, digitized the collection. And we sent these files to Dunbar. A Chicago journalist asked for copies and used them in a TV magazine program. As you'll see, the story inspired another Chicagoan named Umberto Rico, a recently retired pilot and aviation mechanic. And he restarted the aviation training program at Dunbar, carrying Coffee's mission into the 21st century. Next. This actual plane belonged to Cornelius Coffey. He bought this plane when he started to work at this school in 1953. 
it was in museum condition. We could have put it on display, but I thought an airplane, Mr. Coffee's plane, has to fly again. So we're bringing it back to flying condition. We're restoring it and going to recertify it. And then we'll put it in the flying club of the school so the young people that are part of the program can then fly Mr. Coffee's plane. This actual. Ted Robinson had the wisdom to record these amazing individuals for, fu for the future. Um, and when we can preserve and share the treasures in our collections, there's no limit to the positive impact they can have. Janet, let me ask you this question. Uh -huh. um, was this photo taken prior to the CPT program? Yes. Uh, here's yes. a this photo. Here you are. It looks like Willow Brown there. And yes. There's coffee. Uh huh. And uh, others. There's uh, Charles Johnson and some of the other people that were active in flying. What was the occasion for this photo? Uh, this is a memorial of some that, sort. That that was just before we went out to the uh, to fly over put. Flowers over Bessie Coleman Green. Okay. Every Memorial Day, we flew over and we would drop a wreath of flowers mm -hmm. on her grave, mm -hmm. and we would place it there. Mm -hmm. That was really uh, a beautiful day for us mm -hmm. to uh, celebrate. Had you moved to Harlem Airport uh, when this photo was taken? Yes. You were already at yes, Harlem. Yes, we were already at Harlem uh, there. And that was from Reverend Austin Church. Okay. Um, and uh, he was very support. Very mm -hmm. supportive of us mm -hmm. getting into that. You mentioned the civil civilian pilot training program, and we'll come back to that. But I want to ask you about uh, something else that you did. You made application to join the Women's Air Service Pilots Organization. Tell me about that. Oh, these some of these things <clears throat> really hurt. Uh, I had to at the time I was operating this little flight school, Mr. Johnson and myself. We had several girls white girls who were flying my planes and sometime I would go up with them, you know. So you, the, might, you of course by now had a pilot's license. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we would go up and the one day one came and said, Janet, uh, I brought an application for you for the women for the WASP. Mm -hmm. Yes. So fill it out and let's see what we go. Maybe we can get in together. Fine. I fill it out and sure enough I got a telegram from our Mrs. Sheehy. Mrs. Sheehy we were down at the at the, one of the hotels in Chicago, went up to a suite of room, and uh, several of the girls was waiting for me to come in. And I walked in Mrs. Sheehy's room. She looked up there. She said, I told her who I was. She had my application and everything there. She said, oh, no. She said, I, I don't know what to do. I said, what do you mean you don't know what to do? She said, well, I've never interviewed a colored girl for flying. I said, oh, we have plenty of them flying. <laughs> she said, I just don't know what to do. And she didn't interview me uh, anything, and she told me that I would hear from her. Two, about two weeks after that, I did hear from her was the signature of Jacqueline Crockford, who was head of there. Mm -hmm. And she said, whatever Mrs. Sheehy told me still stands. So I was not uh, admitted into the WASP because I was black. Although I was qualified, I think some of the girls who flew the WASP didn't even have their private license. They just had just soloed mm -hmm. and was ferrying planes from different parts. The, I mean, uh, the young white woman, your friend, who was flying with you at Johnson's, did she join the WASP? Did yes, she did. She yeah. was accepted? Uh, she was accepted. Did she have more or less experience? She you? had less experience because I'm and teaching her some of the things in my plane. Mm -hmm. yep, you know, it was one of those things you'd have to be instructed by somebody to ride with you, something like that. Mm -hmm. But that was all right. You got to fly with Ray Thomas as well as uh, George Allen. George, George Allen, mm -hmm. and she. So <clears throat> when, before I could really uh, take my uh, tr uh, flight exam, my commercial uh, expired for the, for the theory. Then I had to go to, Alabama, to uh, Birmingham to retake 
the, the, the written. The written. George took me down to, uh, was a Union town, I guess, to get the bus to go to Birmingham. And the bus did stop at the airport. And George was very nice. He said, Jan Janet, you know, we're flying is something different. You up there, you don't realize that you're on the ground and you're with this segregation thing. And you've been living up north a long time, young lady. You sit here on this bus and don't you move until <laughs> you get off the bus. <laughs> get off the bus and at the airport. And I did move. I was really afraid. What part of the bus did he set you in? The back of the bus, <laughs> bus seat. <laughs> so I sat there and we got off and went into the airport. I don't know if Chief knew this, that they were there at the airport. They wanted me to go around to the back. But I, you know, went right on through the front as if I didn't know what, what the story was. And I took my exam in T.K. Hudson's uh, office. The written now. The written. And uh, he gave it back to me after, after it was over and said, you did very well. And he said, uh, I will let you know when I've come to Tuskegee to give you your exam. Fine. And uh, I asked him, I said, I'm hungry. Where can I get some food? So he called him the janitor in, and the janitor went out and got me uh, a lunch, in which I sat in T.K. Hudson's office and ate the lunch until the bus arrived, going back to Union time that I could get on. So I went back after I passed the written, and we started all over again and things like that. So now the day arrived for when the man said, they always said, the man is coming. You know, you know we were talking about then. He came down that afternoon. It was just after a rain. And the air was just kind of heavy, like, just like silk. It was just beautiful. And they all said, Janet, get in the plane and just, be, just, just relax and everything. So uh, we adorned our parachutes. It is on, I'm not on. OK, young lady, we took off. And uh, he pulled a false landing. And the same place where the kids had told me where he's going to pull it. So, OK, let's climb up, up and doing different maneuvers as we got up and went through the spins and all, everything. And that little plane, you know, everybody had their own plane. And you know, just it seemed like you could talk to it, or it would talk to you. You merged right into a plane. You know, just the feeling you get. And I knew that little old plane was doing everything for me. Coming down, we landed. So happy. There was Ray and and the rest of the instructors was there, came out to see, and Chief came over and said, How did you do, Mr. Hudson? Well, Chief, I tell you. She did very well. I put up against any of your instructors. I've never given a color girl a commercial pilot license. I don't intend to. And we all stood there and looked at each other, you know. And Chief didn't know. Well, I think he was so dumbfounded, he didn't know what to say. Chief will cry in a minute, you know. I think tears were coming out of his eyes. So finally, I said, well, that's all right. We do. Now, if, if he had said, she didn't, she needed to work on her spins, or uh, she needed to do this maneuver, or something that was different. But he said, he didn't say anything was wrong with the flying, but he wasn't going to give me a commercial power license because I was a black woman. So it was pretty sad for all of us. But finally, we broke out to it, got away from it, and started to. I don't know what Chief went and got <clears throat> one of those bottles <laughs> <laughs> that I had uh, brought in from Columbus to him or not, but we got over it. And I stayed there for a couple of more weeks. And I must say this, Chief's wife, Gert, she was the sweetest thing. She was so motivating. She was so encouraging. She said, don't let it get you down, girl. You can do it. So just, just stick with it.
we were discussing what happened when Mr. Emil Mack, your employer at the Chevrolet agency, found out that the Curtis Wright uh, flying service didn't want to admit you after it, accepting your application and they found out that you were not white, uh, they, they refused to admit you. Would you pick up the story there when Mac found out? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Emil Mac had, uh, he had occasion to trust me <coughs> a number of times. He'd take business trips, he'd go fishing, he might go to Florida. At that time, I had pretty well uh, learned the business. I knew the ports and all, and he sort of turned over a certain amount of the activity to me. And he would tell the bookkeeper, when you get your, your uh, receipts together, Coffee will take it to the bank and this and that and the other. So he heard about this incident, and he called me in his office, and he says, hey, he says, Coffee, I understand you and Johnny is then rolled down to Curtis Wright and they won't accept him. I said, that's right, Mr. Mack. He said, well, why? I said, just because we're colored. They don't want to admit us. So I showed him the receipts and I said, we've been paying on the, the course since June. And I said, when they called us in for class assignment, they found out we were colored and they just won't accept us. I said, they want to give us our money back. I said, but Mr. Mack, I said, the money isn't what we want. I said, we realize unless you go through an approved school or unless you work at an airport under the supervision of a licensed mechanic, you'll never get a mechanic certificate. So I said, uh, so I said, they just want us to get us, give us some money. He said, don't take any money back. He said, now, if they still insist on denying you <laughs> to the school, he said, we'll get you a, a lawyer. He said, I'll get you the best lawyer in the state of Illinois and said, we'll sue them for enough money that you can buy your own school. So I said, well, okay. I went back to Johnny and, and I said to Johnny, I said, you know, Mr. Mack said, don't take no money back. Now, up until then, we were plenty worried. Now, what could two, two young mechanics do with a big company like Curtis Wright, see? So uh, we just decided, well, here now, if Mr. Mack is with us, we're probably going to win something, see? So I said, well, I feel a lot better. So we just went along, and about a couple of more weeks, they must have did some checking on their own. And they found out that we had this airplane. We was flying a little at, at acres. We were working, earning our living as mechanics. And they must have checked to find out how my boss felt about me and what he was willing to do. So they called us in. And they said to uh, John and myself, said, now, you two young fellows seem to be determined that you're going to attend school and you won't accept your money back, so now we're going to let you attend school. But now we're not going to be responsible for you. So you're going to be on your own. And if anything happens, that's going to be your own fault. Well, we accepted the challenge, see? So we started to school. And this would have been in when now? It was been the latter part of, well, I said first of, uh, of 29, because okay. 31, it took us two years. See? Now, in the meantime, we started school now, mm -hmm. see? And it was plenty rough, I'm going to tell you that, see? For this reason, when we would go to the tool crib to draw our tools, well, you know, you'd take people that picking at you, and they'd get ahead of us and try to make us mess up, see? And I had told Johnny, look, we're going to make it one, you know, regardless, see? When we go to the, uh, the uh, candy machine at recess, they'd get ahead of us. So this went on maybe a month, see? Well, now that instructor, Jack Snyder, see? He's the one that was watching this, see? This is him right here, Jack Snyder. Okay, that's Jack Snyder. Mr. That's Tom. Jack Snyder. He was World War I pilot, 
ace, and after World War I, he became uh, employed by Ford Motor Car Company, and from there he went to Curtis Wright. Okay. As his, that was my chief instructor there. All right, now we'll go back to this picture later on, but I just wanted to That's identify all right. That's him. That's Jack Snyder. Okay. Now he was watching all of this behavior, so it related aviation. He called everybody together and he said, now look. This is one of the courses, related aviation. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, that's the theory, oh. see? We have shop work and we'd have related aviation classes. And, and uh, he called this group together and he said, you know something? He said, as far as I'm concerned, there's only two gentlemen in my class. He said, that's Coffin Robinson. He said, now I tell you, fellas, he said, I don't know how they, you know, uh, 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 put up with all this stuff. He said, I'd have broke somebody's head. He said, but they too much of a gentleman. He said, now I'm going to tell you about those two fellas. He said, they own their own airplane. <laughs> they flying when they get a chance. They earn and they live in as auto mechanics. And he said, now, at examination time, he said, they probably won't need you. He said, you probably need them. So you better be careful how you treat people. So then after that lecture, see, we couldn't spend our money. See, they wouldn't let you buy nothing. See, it just turned right around. And, and after that, it became a pleasure, I'm telling you. Uh, we went through class. We finished the first two, first and second in our class. Now. That is after we got in school, see? Mr. L. M. Sherbuck, who was the director of Curtis Wright, he made a speech at our graduation. He said, now you two fellows have proven yourself above the average. He said, you have proven yourself, gentlemen, said if you know of any other colored students, that want to take aviation. And if you get a sizable group together, we'll enroll them. So this, the doors is going to always be open to colored students. Say, but if you get this group together, we'll make you assistant instructors. And that's how we went to the Defender. We went everywhere we could think of to recruit students. That's how Heard came in the picture, Heard Nash. Muldrow, I even wrote to him in Detroit. He told me, said, Coffee, if, it, if you ever find out if I can get in school, let me know. I'll come to Chicago. Hampton, uh, uh, Kenneth Camel, that used to be the alderman. Uh, uh, White, Dale White. There was about 30 some odd people that we got together and they enrolled. Let me ask See? you about this Glenview yeah. program and then we'll get back to your program. Yeah. This Army Air Corps Primary Flying School at Glenview yeah. actually had primary Army Air Corps cadets? That's right. It was the only school this side of the Mississippi River with a, a primary Army school. Was it they it, were training cadets. Was it some talk at one time that that was supposed to be a school for colored cadets? Well, they didn't know exactly. See, it, it was so, uh, 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 you see, uh, uh, I could I could tell you what I thought, mm -hmm. but that ain't good enough. See? No, it's yes, it is. No, uh, I tell you why. Because I didn't have it in in in, in uh, black and white. Mm -hmm. But you see, we uh, actually was pressing for a unit in the Chicago area. Mm -hmm. See? Yes. And not only had I proved to the army that it was feasible, but if I if you recall, every ten students that I took. I had one white student and one girl student in that unit. What I was trying to do is to prove to our government that we not only could teach white students and they could fly together. See, they always told you that they couldn't, you couldn't integrate them. I said you could because my first student after I got my transport was a white student. He took 15 minutes, he was working at the shop at the airport. He had told me all along, Mr. Coffey, I want to be your first student. When you get your transport license, 
I'll take off and be. So sure enough, when I came back from Glenview, and he said, did you get it? I said, yeah, it is. He said, I'm ready to take the lesson. So he asked BNF to let him off 15 minutes so I could fly him for this first <laughs> 15 minutes. And that's what happened, see? So I wanted to prove to our government that we not only could fly as a group, see, there was no excuse. I proved that. If anyone has any questions for Pam and Hannah, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A box. Um, thank you both so much for doing this. <laughs> these are some of my favorite videos. As Pam mentioned, I digitize this collection and these are just snippets of some fantastic stories from this group of people. And thank you both for helping us share them with everyone today. Um, while we're waiting for questions, I have a couple of questions for you both. Um, so you've mentioned a couple of times that this collection has been used by various people. How popular is this collection and how do researchers use this video history interview, but also other video history interviews in the video history collection, um, in their projects? We've had them used for, you know, television programs, academic projects, um, and, you know, it's a, there's a wide range of materials. We have a lot of uh, medical technology collections in video history. And what was really, we didn't expect with that is there are a lot of patent lawsuits over things like PCR and cell sorter. And we went through a phase where we were constantly sending these out to basically every patent law school, every patent law firm in the country including law schools like Harvard Business School. They have copies in their library because these cases are studied so much as part of um, patent law. So that was a quirky uh, use that we were not expecting when we first had this collection. But things, there are a, a group of biographical ones like these um, that really um, get the stories out there and Hannah can say more about which ones she does regularly, but we it's, it's a collection that's used all the time. Yeah, I, I field most of like the video history reference questions, and this is by far the most, the Black Aviators collection is the one I get most, and it's my favorite one to work with. Um, it always, you know, if I, I'll drop it really quickly just to um, respond to these, just because I, I love this collection so much. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of those, and I would say, there is a real range of people. Um, I worked with like a children's book author in the last year or so who was really interested and they come in batches. So like once word gets out or someone starts using um, one, like you'll get, a, you'll get a bunch of people who also want to use that same collection, which was pretty typical for, for this one. Um, word of mouth spreads. Absolutely. Uh, one of the questions that came in was, uh, were there any documents that came with these interviews, anything that we've received as part of Ted Robinson's process of research? Um, they said they'd love to share the name. They'd love to have the names of the students that were in some of these classes, particularly the women. Well, we have the NASA archives because Ted Robinson worked at NASA has Ted Robinson's research files. They contact the archives at the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, they should be able to get a hold of his research files for the Black Wings exhibit because he, he was on detail to us from FAA to do that exhibit. And then this was an extension of that. So the files for the Black Wings exhibit covers people who were no longer alive as well as this group of people. Great. Another question that came in, how much information do we have or can we share about Mr. Coffey's service with the Civil Air Patrol beginning in 1942? I, Pam, I think that's a, a question for you. You'd have to look within his files. Um, he's very involved in all sorts of 
activities around World War II, and he discusses those in depth um, in the interview. So you could listen to those sections of it and find out about it. He's also part of a um, National Guard would not accept African Americans, uh, like so many other things. So they formed their own uh, National Guard uh, for African Americans uh, in Illinois. And he was part of that group as well. And he discusses that. And we see a plane with one of the logos on it. Uh, so there were many things like that where they, they want to participate. Sometimes they can participate. Um, but unfortunately, it, it depends upon um, a white person saying, yes, you can do that. Um, it shouldn't be. I mean, they're qualified. They shouldn't be dependent upon the whims of somebody who decides that day whether or not they're going to let an African-American do it. They're qualified. So fortunately, they pushed a lot to get us past that to the point where Curtis Wright would just take students routinely, something like the Curtis Wright uh, Aviation School, things like that. But, you know, when they were doing this, it was really not easy. Absolutely. Uh, there have been a handful of varying questions and iterations on how can people access these videos, um, not just the clips that we shared, but the full interviews themselves. Um, if you want to email, I think it the, it's been popped into the chat, but email sihistory at si.edu um, and uh, email and that will come to me or Pam and we will be able to uh, help you get copies of those. Like we said, um, we love sharing this collection, so we would love to get those emails to help share both video files and transcripts and we'll send them via email. Yeah, I was going to say this entire collection has been digitized. And so um, one of the questions was whether or not the person needs to come to DC. And no, you do not. Um, Pam and Hannah routinely send things to uh, offsite researchers. Um, another question Have you ever had any family members of these aviators reach out for access to the interviews? Um, and if not with this collection, then perhaps some of the other video histories? Um, I don't think uh, in my, I've only been here a few years, which is just a fraction of time in Smithsonian employee timelines, but um, not for video history, but we do have, um, someone did reach out for an oral history interview who, um, their father was a security guard at the Smithsonian and um, he um, was kind of just researching his dad and found his name mentioned in a finding aid that he, uh, of ours, that he did an interview, like a short 25 minute oral history interview in 1996 at the Festival of American Folklife. And um, he emailed kind of asking about it and seeing if he could get the recording because he didn't have any, his father had passed away and his father didn't have any, or he didn't have any recording of his father's voice. And so we were able to share that with him so he could listen to his dad's voice again. And that was um, when we do get those family requests, it is, it's really special. I love that so much. We've gotten a lot over the years. They, they're doing some family history and they come across our oral history collection. And it's really nice to be able to give these back to families. Um, one of the places is um, we had a bunch of interviews about Panama and we also have a collection of photographs um, that were taken in Panama by two ornithologists. And I interviewed them and we have their oral histories and we have some films of theirs that we digitized. And an anthropologist in Panama has made these of known to the people in um, Panama by publishing them in a magazine and a, then a book. And we actually heard from families of the people in the photographs that Wetmore took. And we were able to send them the films, uh, the oral histories and the photographs down there. Uh, we did the same thing with um, a film and oral history we had about a zoo expedition to Liberia in 1940. And um, we were able to send the film back to uh, Liberia and they then we gave them permission to reproduce it. And it was all these people, it was the first color footage anybody had of Liberia and they were out in the country and all these people recognized their grandparents, their great aunt, their great uncle, you know, that sort of thing. And they would sell copies of it um, and the money would go to um, a scholarship fund. 
So that was really nice. So it's, I like especially when we can give these collections back to the community, to family members. It's just great fun to be able to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. I love it when we can help families either, you know, see or hear relatives or, you know, just recover a piece of their history. I think that's so, that's so fantastic and uh, sometimes unexpected perk of the job. Um, can you, you already talked about this a little bit, but can you tell us about some of the other oral history collections that are heavily used? Um, Pam, I know you mentioned the, the medical collections, um, but are there any others? And, or do you have one that you're, it's your favorite um, that you can share some interesting tidbits about? Well, probably my favorite interviews, in addition to this collection, are interviews that I did are <laughs> your next film fest. Um, with someone by the name of Roxy Laybourne, who developed the field of forensic ornithology. And you'll find out what that is if you, if you attend the next film fest. And she was an utterly unique character, um, just an amazing human being um, at the Natural History Museum. Um, and there are just some, I love so many of the interviews. I mean, I primarily interview people who work at the Smithsonian. So that's what the, the project that Hannah and I work on. That's what we interview. And the Smithsonian has many quirky, unusual people. Um, kind of a lot of characters floating around here. So they're really fun to talk to and get their life stories. Um, the video history collection was somewhat different and it came to Smithsonian archives, but it was scholars across the Smithsonian could set these up. Um, and, uh, oh, but Frank, we we're, were able to get the Lundeberg interviews out pretty quickly. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to the chat there. Uh, but uh, that was another one. Uh, yes, and I did, and Alex Magoon in the chat is telling us about my G. Arthur Cooper oral history interviews, which are also popular. But we, we interviewed quite a number of very unusual people for that. And the ones that I done have been primarily audio um, and we've done some video, but they do get heavy usage. I mean, we're always doing reference on the oral history collection for a wide variety of purposes. So that's kind of fun. Um, my, just while we're talking about favorite collections, um, my favorite collection is uh, a collection of interviews with Latin American women administrators that Pam did down at our Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama. Um, it's the premier place to study tropical biology around the world. And this was a collection I started working on when I first came to the Smithsonian. And I was not someone really, really interested in there, had done a lot of work in the history of science or the history of how science is facilitated. And then these interviews with these women were just like, totally phenomenal and just like blew my mind and just I fell down every rabbit hole still do um and I love when I get to um work with them and share them with other people so um, just piggyback on Pam yeah and I'm not being interviewed but I've seen all of these so I'll share my favorites as well um I like some of the the slightly unexpected ones like the Waltham clock company video history interviews and the slate, the Vermont slate company. And just because I don't know, sometimes with all of the medical science ones, these are people who are used to talking about their jobs a lot. They're used to talking about sort of the technical aspects and with the Waltham clock and Vermont slate ones, you're getting really like the workers who are doing these very detailed, specific tasks, talking about their work. And you're seeing sort of their passion come through um, with their everyday um, jobs. And it's just, I love it. It's fascinating. I love this collection. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to answer this question. There's a question about um, if the, there's a reason the videos can't be posted in partial or in full on YouTube or another public facing resource. So there are a couple of factors. Pam and Hannah can talk a little bit about their potential restrictions for some of them, but we also have an accessibility component. So this video, this Black Aviators collection is not restricted at all. We can put it up online, but we do have um, accessibility steps that we need to do before we can put those up online. And we're working on it. I promise my goal is to get these videos out to everybody 
in full, especially this particular collection, because it is one of my favorites, um, but we're, we're not there yet, but we are working on it. Uh, another question that has come through, um, how has your team navigated working from home? Are you still collecting oral histories? And if so, how are you doing it? Well, fortunately, um, we were almost done digitizing the entire oral history collection. So, um, and I mean, we started this collection in 73. Those transcripts were typewritten, but Courtney Belizzi, who worked with me, came up with the idea that we just absolutely had to stand at the copier and PDF them all. So we have in electronic form, all of our transcripts. And we just this year, Kira helped with this, finished digitizing all of the audio tapes. Um, so we now have the entire collection uh, digitized and it was almost digitized when, when we went into this. So we're able to do reference um, and we have done interviews on Zoom. We've continued moving forward and we're processing interviews. So we're getting transcripts done, we're getting finding aids written, things like that. So um, because we had digitized our collection and a whole bunch of our resources that we use for research and everything, Hannah and I have just been able to, I think, kind of seamlessly work from home. It's been good for us. There are other jobs like conservators in the archives, Kira's job where they're actually digitizing documents. It, you know, it's, it, it can be very difficult um, to do that work from home. But most of what Hannah and I do, what do you think, Hannah? Yeah, no, I would, I would say there are a couple things that we need to be in the office for in terms of research, but I really, most of our work, and I, we, I think we've been particularly lucky, and I know I'm very grateful to be able to still do like fulfilling work from home um, and to get a lot of these interviews out. And there really hasn't been a, every once in a while, there's kind of a slower process due to working from home, but for the most part, we're able to like efficiently and quickly get these out to folks. Great. So you are the experts in this. Um, are there any tips you'd like to share with folks interested in conducting their own oral history interviews at their organizations or at home? Um, yeah, so there are a lot of incredible resources online. I think the entire oral history community, both at the Smithsonian and just as a, an entire field has been really working to come up with best practices and ways to, so people can continue, especially, uh, you know, as we enter into another year of this, you know, being from home and being separate, how we are able to connect virtually um, to collect memories that could be leaving us soon. Um, so there are a lot of online resources. You can use your phone, you can use Zoom, like we're using right now. Um, we have an incredible group of volunteers who have worked with us to come up with um, specific uh, ways to, because to create um, a good quality Zoom recording for an oral history interview. Um, we do have resources um, online on our website on how to conduct oral history. The uh, Center for Folklife also has some incredible resources um, and the Oral History Association always has a list of best practices. So I would say if you are looking to start, um, I'd start, I'd start there. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one last question. Pam, you've been working on this program since the 1970s. Do you have a close relationship with any of the people you've interviewed? Yes, um, there are people that, um, Watson Perigo, who is one of the ornithologists who went to Panama, he was like a grandfather to me. Um, and long after I stopped interviewing him, I would visit him and his wife all the time. Uh, the same way with Lucy Mann, who was the wife of the director of the zoo and a zoo editor and just an incredibly wonderful character. Um, and she's the one who went on the trip to Liberia, I had her narrate the film. And I also did long oral history with her. And we remained close until her death. I mean, for many of these people, I've had an ongoing relationship with them. And I'm just really privileged to get to know these people or you just, you know, you work on, on the collection and you learn so much from Janet Harmon Bragg, from Cornelius Coffey, 
from Lucille Mann, from a Watson Prairie, about how to live your life, how to cope with the challenges in life. I've learned so much from them. And, and these are really kind and positive people. I just, I'm just privileged to get to know them. Even if I never met Janet and Cornelius in person, I've learned from them. And so I really, um, yeah, no, we're not doing oral histories with me. Um, <laughs> I'm reading the chat here. Um, we're trying, people. I see your requests for an interview with Pam. We're we're trying as part of the 175th. Oh. It it will happen. This is me putting it out into the ether. We will do this. But um, but I've been really privileged to get to know them. And um, I never had a grandfather. Watson Perry, though, both my grandfathers died before I was born, and I, he really became like a grandfather to me. So you can have very now, we had one director here who was very un uncomfortable with that. He felt you should go in, sit down, do your interview, walk out, and never have like an interpersonal relationship. But for me, when someone tells you your life story, their life story, shares their life story with you, um, you, you have to develop a much more intimate relationship. So um, I've been, and I've been really lucky with the people that I got to know. Is there anyone that you've interviewed that you've had a relationship with and wanted to interview again as a result of that? I've actually gone back several times, like 10 years later, um, and picked up and done more interviews about where they've, they've gone since then. Yeah. Yeah. Although, um, I mean, the people that we interviewed, um, who is a paleontologist, was G. Arthur Cooper, Gus Cooper. Um, but many of these people are elderly. Um, the first person we interviewed, I didn't do the interview for the oral history project. He worked at the Smithsonian for 78 years. I'm not kidding. Uh, two other people worked at the Smithsonian for 75 years, 50 to 60 years is not unusual amongst the people that I was interviewing. And Roxy Laybourne fits in there. She's over 60 years at the Smithsonian. So, um, for some of them, you know, if you're 102, you're probably not going to be able to go um, back 10 years later and interview them. But some of the younger ones, yeah, I have gone back because I've done really interesting things afterwards. And I've been able to sit down and talk with them. That's fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for being here and sharing the stories of um, Cornelius Coffey and Janet Harmon Bragg with everyone. There was several comments in the chat about wanting to hear more of their stories and hear more about them and, um, and their, their work and their life. So thank you for, thank you for sharing this with us and thank you everyone for attending. We hope you will join us for our next month's presentation about women in ornithology.